call the Sleen City Council meeting order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a few changes to the agenda tonight. Um, for, uh, under consent agenda, we're going to take off item 11, 182, and I don't know if that would go under unfinished business. Because we've talked about that before. Maybe we'll put it after unfinished business. Um, and then we got an email, or some, we had some communications today with the applicant for the special land use at the BP station, and they are um, at this point in time withdrawing the special land use application. Um, until further notice, there's been a bit of a change with the franchise agreement, and they don't, um, don't know really where it's going to go. So at this point in time, it's not, there's no point in hearing or discussing that issue. So we're going to take that off the agenda. And um, under unfinished business item 11-136, there is a new first page to the um, ordinance number 735. I think everybody has the updated uh, verbiage on their desk. And um, I will be moving that in two separate motions, the uh, actual acknowledging receipt and the uh, motion to approve. So are there any other additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Mayor, Mayor Bob? I'd like to remove, since we're not to consent it, but C1175. Okay. And then under discussion, I'd like to talk about payment of property taxes. Sorry? Payment of property taxes and proposals. Under discussion. Under discussion. <clears throat> Any other uh, additions or changes to the agenda? If not, do we have a motion to uh, approve the agenda as amended? So, so moved. Move moral. Do we have a second? I support. Port Roth. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have no absences this evening. Citizen comment on agenda items on the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question on items that appear on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. And when you'd like to speak, is requested by not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Robert Lane. I live at 680 Canterbury in Saline. Uh, I want to comment on the uh, rules and regulations of Oakwood Cemetery that are going to be changed or, or voted on. Um, I'm on the Cemetery Board of Appeals, and I voted against these changes uh, when it came up for a vote on our uh, board meeting about a couple of weeks ago. I found a problem with uh, page 14 of your handout where it states that um, fun, what perpetual care means. I found that, um, that if these regulations are followed on page 14, that uh, there will be no care for the cemetery, no funds provided. Uh, it would seem natural to me that if, uh, if, you're, if the cemetery is going to be taken care of, that it would come out of this trust fund. And uh, if the way it looks to me, the way it's worded, there would be no funds for the cemetery. The cemetery is in pretty bad shape. The, um, if you go up there and look at it, you'll see that most of the tombstones in the old part were made of um, marble. And they're usually narrow in sh uh, shape. They're easily damaged, and a lot of them have been kicked over and vandalized. <coughs> um, when I uh, looked in the records, I found on uh, 1924, the, um, this uh, perpetual care, um, whatever was passed back then, and uh, they did it to ensure the care of the old cemetery. That was the main reason for it. And um, so w what I'm concerned about is that if we allow this to pass without providing some sort of funds for the cemetery, that it's going to uh, be like it was abandoned. 
and all we're going to be doing is cutting the grass in the cemetery. So I would urge you, if you uh, pass this or vote for it, that you provide some sort of funding uh, for the care of the older part of the cemetery. Okay, thank you. Mary has 600 Canterbury regarding the changes of the uh, Cemetery Board of Appeals. I also uh, concur that the older part of the cemetery is the hill. And many of those stones, as the historical commission said, there are certain things now you can put on them and it'll take off the, the mold and uh, what he had requested was maybe a certain amount for stones that are over a hundred years old. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the council will look uh, and, and walk the cemetery. I think that it's kind of the uh, poor stepchild of the city that happens to have almost a million dollars in it. Uh, we don't go there very often. And uh, I, I think that the older stones should be, uh, there's some that are broken, and I think something in the perpetual care that it is allowable if it's looked at. Also the flags, of course, which will be up eight months this year, uh, this month, are probably going to be up till spring because the ground will be frozen and they look very, very bad. Thank you. Is there any further comments? Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion or with the request of any citizen or council member. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. Um, we have taken off two items off the agenda, item 11182 and 1175. Um, do we have a motion to approve and adopt the items on the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Gearbaugh? Second. Second to Har. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under public hearings, item 11183, this is application from Leave Hair Aerospace, Celine Incorporated for an industrial facilities tax exemption. We need a motion to acknowledge receipt of the November 15, 2011 memo from Finance Director Burgoyne. Move to acknowledge receipt. Move moral. Second. Second, Gearbaugh. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we need comments from the applicant. Is there anybody He's here? Nobody's here from Leave Hair. Hmm. Hmm. Yep. Were they noticed, Mr. Burgoyne, to come tonight? Do you know? I did not specifically call them, but they received public notice. Okay. At, at the special projects uh, meeting, they said they would come, and they knew that it was tonight. Maybe, um, maybe they're just delayed. Okay. Well, the applicant's not here, so we'll move on to um, opening the public hearing. We have a motion to open the public hearing, affording the public, the applicant, all taxing units, and op an opportunity to be heard. So moved. Move gear by. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Peters. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Is there anyone that would like to speak to this issue? Move to close the public hearing. Second. We're all second to hard to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> public hearing is now closed. So there's a motion to approve and adopt or not adopt the resolution approving application of Leap Hair Aerospace Saline Incorporated for industrial facilities exemption certificate for a new facility for a total project cost of $4,400,000 consisting of $3,250,000 for building and land improvements, excluding land cost, and $1,150,000 for eligible machinery, equipment, furniture, and fixtures, subject to the applicant entering into a tax abatement agreement with the City of Saline. To authorize or not authorize the Mayor Clerk to execute said tax abatement agreement as prepared and approved by the City Attorney. Move to approve and adopt and to authorize. Move to hard to approve and adopt and to authorize. We have a second. I'll second. Roth. 
Uh, discussion? Mr. Rhodes? I have um, two comments that I would like to make, and uh, they, they pertain to um, IFT uh, applications in, in general, uh, as well as to this one. And the first is that I think that we should eliminate the category of furniture from tax exemption. I, I think it's inappropriate to ask our other city residents to, in effect, subsidize the purchase of desks and chairs. I, I believe the intent of this when it first started up was to encourage the purchase and installation of production equipment. And to me, tables, chairs, conference tables, those kinds of things do not fall under that category. And I believe that in the future they should be removed from the calculation. The, the second point that I wanted to make was um, there is a um, calculation in there that uh, determines a theoretical number of new jobs based on dividing the amount of the investment by $50,000 on the assumption that $50,000 supports one new job. And I don't believe that to be accurate at all. Um, and in fact, the purchase of more sophisticated equipment might actually reduce the number of jobs. So I would like to see that calculation removed from the application and instead an application of a statement by the applicant that says that they, are, they intend to generate X number of new jobs based on this investment and the period of time that they intend to do that by. So <clears throat> those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Boyne, do you have a comment? Um, that uh, statement of the number of jobs and when they intend to do that is in the application. So that, that, all, that information is there. That, that's from which we uh, do the calculation. That calculation, by the way, is only about one-tenth of the overall points, generally. So um, that had been debated by uh, Special Projects Commission in the past. Um, in the past, that was up to 25 or 30 percent of jobs. And uh, in fact, um, we had a Michigan Jobs Commission and so forth, and there was a focus on jobs. And it's true that as technology has moved forward, and for, from the point of view of the city, we get a great return on personal property, uh, machinery, and equipment. So valuing uh, jobs where sometimes efficiency requires slightly fewer jobs seems counterintuitive. So that was a struggle for a special projects to look at that. But I, I will bring that up to them. Again, I'll bring your points up to them. OK, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Roth. I agree with and concur with Mr. Rhodes at, in the same, same points. Looking at tax abatements, I always felt it was kind of an expense for the city and the people receiving the taxes for the tax abatements. In this particular case, if they have 15 <coughs> new jobs, it's going to cost us in tax monies about $8,000 per job per year for the next 12 years. That's a big concession that we're doing, especially on furniture that's going to be probably written off in that amount of time and things changed over the 12 year period. So I, I, I agree with him that we need to look at that particular form and the way we rate the points. And I think 12 years is a very long period of time likewise. I, I, I guess my comments, and I, I think Mr. Burgoyne has more to probably add, but a couple of points. The 15 jobs is actually the actual jobs they estimate, and it's a shame Mr. somebody isn't here from leave here. And this is their fourth expansion, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and a total of I think 33,000 square foot again, and they are intending on adding 15 jobs. So the valuation and the investment actually is a $4 million investment, which would, if you value the jobs at 50,000 per job, that's 88 jobs. So to your, back to your point. But um, as far as the furniture and fixtures, that the basis is because that's, they pay personal property tax on that. So we're basically we're abating personal property tax. And we've had this discussion before, if that personal property tax disappears, which there is some conversation of that, there would be some clawbacks involved with this, and um, it would be somewhat of a moot point. <laughs> so 
and I know that the furniture and fixtures is, there's some highly, pretty quickly depreciated um, items, and I think that the workstations and the computer areas are one of those that depreciates, like in three years, I believe. So it's a really nominal amount of this investment, but I think certainly we should be bringing it back to the uh, projects committee. Let's go, Mr. Bourgoin, if you could, you want to add? Yes, I, I just wanted to say in terms of the additional cost, once we set out the Reddy's Industrial Park in 1983, uh, since then we have had infrastructure and uh, costs and upkeep and we do have to redo Woodland Drive. Whether somebody invests four million or ten million or however many million isn't going to change our costs. Um, I, so I, I don't see that connection. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as a member of the Special Projects Commission, um, I'm pretty enthusiastic um, about this motion and enthusiastic in support of the motion. Um, and I believe it was at our last Special Projects Commission meeting that um, Commissioner Mary Hess asked the applicant um, about, the, um, about how the company has evolved in this community over the last 20 years and how small it was and how it's grown and developed. Um, and Laybear is, is one of our, probably our most important members of the industrial park and probably one of our most valued corporate citizens. Um, and these tax abatements have enabled them to create jobs and expand their facility. Um, and I think it's an exciting uh, investment in our industrial park, in our community at a time when there's not a lot of industrial um, development and, and expansions taking place both within this region uh, and across the country. Um, so again, I, I enthusiastically support the, the, the motion. Um, and to Mr. Rhodes' point, um, I think it's um, certainly fair and reasonable that at the next Special Projects Commission meeting, we discuss the allocation of points for um, furniture. Um, I'm not sure the issue is as clear cut um, as some would suggest, but I think one of the things that makes our Special Projects Commission unique um, and, and staff has evaluated this and determined it to be true is that our process is very thorough, very inclusive, and very ob uh, objective. Uh, in fact, probably more so than any other municipality uh, in the county. So I think it's a fair suggestion, and, and as a, a member of the Special Projects Commission, um, I look forward to staff putting that on a future agenda for us to discuss and, and debate. Um, further discussion? Mr. Gearbox. Um, I agree. At times we need to tweak the um, abatement um, scoring and such. One of the issues was as our um, industry gets cleaner, we've always provided additional points and scores for um, items that are no longer an issue. It's like heavy, heavy metal plating, those types of industries, and that we potentially could put something in there that are encouraging businesses to not only be more energy efficient, but ways of reducing their costs so that they will be able to retain themselves here even if they don't put a lot of investment into their companies. We've got to find ways to retain them, encourage them to grow, and other aspects which those could potentially lead to that, which would help them reduce their costs. We can't always look at just cutting their taxes, but the overall health and survivability of the company itself. So I believe that Liebherr, of course, is one of our best um, industries right now, but we need to encourage them, and I think this is a great move forward for that. And we do need to look at formulas, but the way they're calculated have always been fluctuating, and so as we look at it every couple of years or even every year, we should review them and assess whether or not they should be applicable. We did. We, when was the last time we reviewed them? I know we did. Um, about two years, two years a, a little over a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, on the environmental item, we, we leave that credit in there um, at in order to reduce giving credit to somebody who's not as clean or who would put an, a uh, biological oxygen demand load on our treatment plant or something like that. And those items we could continue to support, but certain other items that are on there are no longer as applicable because the way that we don't have a heavy manufacturing plant in the sound yet. We took those out. Did. I think we right. took a lot of that out. It was mostly the because we have a lot of food processing now in the right. facility in our park, so that impacts our wastewater treatment. Um, and also, the uh, just to follow up with what, because so because Lee Pierce not here. Usually, we ask the applicant to talk about what they're doing with a facility. It's the aerospace portion, um, which is a growing um, segment. There's actually two subsidiaries of Lee Pierce in in that building, and um, this the aerospace um, actually is growing uh, quite nicely and. They're the um, arm that purchased the 54 acres behind their current building. 
So I think, you know, if anything, that shows, shows a, you know, hopefully retention and long-term sustainability for this business. So um, they have been a good uh, community partner also. Um, it was pointed out by our clerk that we do not have for a 12-year period after uh, the, um, with the city of Saline. So that third line from the bottom of the paragraph, fixture subjects of applicant entering into a tax abatement agreement with the city of Saline for a 12-year period. If we could add that, if that would be acceptable to Mr. Har yes. and Mr. Roth, that would yes. be acceptable? Yes. Okay. Um, is there further discussion on the motion? Mr. Roth. I'd just like to make it my point clear that I'm not really in favor of tax abatement statewide. I think it's probably, it's good for trying to attract industry, but we have to play the game in order to get the people here. And I want to say for Leap Air, I think, I think they're an excellent company. They've been here for many years. That this is, I'm not against any particular company. I want everybody to be fair, and I also like their, the other taxpayers to be fair, treat a fair likewise, instead of general community pick up some losses, especially when money's hard. Any further discussion on the motion? Mr. Burgoyne. Uh, w one more point. Uh, some of you may not know, but uh, prior to deciding, uh, the German headquarters deciding to allow this to come to Celine, um, there was quite a competition with, I think, Laval, Quebec. Uh, and uh, without the tax abatement, we would not have gotten it. That's true, and Anniver Spark and city staff, we went and did a big presentation, so it's been a while, but good point, Mr. Burgoyne. Um, okay. I, I'm just against it overall statewide. Not, I think it's a very important that Celine plays the game, otherwise we won't have it. We'll be out. Well, the, you know, Leib here is a very large corporation, and they look um, globally for when they make an investment. Uh, we had tried to get another very significant investment from another subsidiary of Leap Hair and they ended up going to Mexico and brought the governor in. That was a couple years ago. But So um, they do have opportunities for growth and they do look at Celine seriously and I think they will continue. Um, they were actually all the Leap Hair children, the third generation, were here for Peter Cosmo's retirement in October and um, we had dinner together and I pitched them really hard. Only one of them hadn't been to Selene before, and she was very impressed. So hopefully they'll be thinking of us next time they do anything in North America. Um, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have taken 11184 off the agenda. And we're under unfinished business, item 11136. This is the ordinance number 735, solicitors and transient merchants. This would be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the uh, November 30th, 2011 memo from City Clerk Hill. And second reading, a proposed amended ordinance number 735, an ordinance to repeal Article 2, peddlers, solicitors, and transient merchants of Chapter 22, businesses of the Saline City Code, and replace it with the following revised Article 2. We have a motion. Move to approve and adopt. Move roads. Second. Second Gearbaugh. Discussion. Ms. Hill, I think, wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, yes. Um, since this was last before you, staff, which was Detective Lupi and Deputy Clerk um, Jack and Linda Moore, myself, um, and Council Member Rhodes have met at least four times and fine tuned it even further. Um, trying to make it more concise, um, easy to read, understandable, um, and that is what you have before you this evening. But I have a couple small changes. Um, if you go to section 22-33, which is on page 4 of the ordinance itself, not the red line copy, prohibited activities. Um, section 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, um, where it specifically says solicitor, we would like it to read solicitor or transient merchant so that it's clear that it relates to both of those categories. And then you also had before you this evening um, the change to page 1 of the actual ordinance. Um, which defined what solicitor was. 
with that. I think it's ready for adoption unless there's any changes that council sees that they would like to make. Okay, so we have a motion on floor discussion. Mr. Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge um, our former colleague, uh, Mr. Law, who I believe was one of the individuals who initiated this, this review. Um, and so had it not been for his, his comments and suggestions, I'm, I'm not sure this process would have begun. So I want to thank him for that. Um, and I especially want to thank Mr. Rhodes and Detective Lupai and City Superintendent Rubel, Clerk Hill and Deputy Clerk Linda Moore for their work on this. Um, I, I think this is a, a really nice addition to our ordinance. Um, as I had previously stated, and I think I offered a, an amendment or a motion to this effect, I would have liked to have seen um, the hours in section 22-34 um, hours of operations um, changed and tweaked ever so slightly. I think I recommended a, a 10 to 6 p.m. time period for solicitation Monday through Saturday. Um, that was not a, a adopted. Um, so that would be the only thing that, that I see as, as a little bit weak in this document. Um, but that's certainly not going to prevent me from voting to uh, approve the changes. And again, overall, I think it's a, a, a really outstanding um, a addition to, to the language we currently have in our ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Peters. Just one quick, quick, two quick questions, actually. Uh, I see we still use the word canvasser, and uh, most every definition I've been able to find on canvassing is, pertains to votes, uh, counting votes and obtaining votes. Is that something we still want to include as a definition of solicitor? I, don't know. I, I haven't looked at the definition myself, so I okay. don't know. We did make an exception for political um, reasons under the exceptions. So even if it did mean that, it, there would probably be an exception for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, I see we were not prepared to offer a one-day license. The shortest term you can buy is, is a week. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So some other communities offer a one-day. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and just for one day, it wouldn't seem worth it to us or maybe even them. To Mr. Peter's question, uh, quickly, Mayor, uh, I apologize. I know that uh, in the, the political world, we, we still refer to door-to-door -door as canvassing. Um, so I do think that's an appropriate word to use in this, in this case. So I'm going to keep poking at it. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put my two cents in um, about, you know, we talked a lot about eat dark after hours, like at the end of the day, and you know, I still sort of, I'm struggling um, being a single woman <laughs> about having to open my door, you know, when it's dark out. And especially, I think, for a senior single woman. I mean, you obviously don't have to open your door, but I mean, by allowing that, we're sort of, so I'm, I'm wondering, you guys obviously, I know we've had conversations on and off about this, and um, I just, I guess maybe, is there a way, you know, 7 p.m. is plenty in the summer, but it's dark at 6 here right now. So is there any way that we could maybe put, you know, after sunset, not allowed? Or we did I just discuss, feel like that's sort of, it's really tough. We discussed dawn to dusk. Um, actually, I had an outside conversation just tonight um, in related to, to the hunting rules. They say a half hour before sunset to a half hour after, or sunrise to a half hour after sunset. Um, there's options like that too um, that gets a little bit vague to people so the time thing is is more specific and it would get confusing if we made summer hours winter hours and dates and times so yeah we discussed all that and, and I'm open to whatever everybody would well, like. I was thinking 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday um, or but put in there in the parentheses but not after sunset so it meaning it would be 7 p.m. during the summer hours, but if it was the winter hours, it would have to be, because I know the hours, I mean, obviously it's all, it's different yeah, that's, depending on that's the time, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know how the rest of Cal, I mean, I'm willing to vote for this, because I know staff, has, we've, I know we spent a ton of time on this, but it's still that sort of a, a little sticky thing for me that I think is really an issue for um, our residents. Mr. Campbell. Just a, uh, just a, uh, point of interest, the more 
um, complex that we make the rules, the more complex it's going to be to enforce the rules. And more, and I'm, I'm not suggesting, I'm just putting it out there for, for your thought process for consideration, but the more detailed, I mean, and Detective Loop, I can certainly speak to this as a law enforcement officer, the more detailed um, and, dare I say, convoluted a, a law or a rule, it's, it's that way on the, on the enforcement side as well. And, and in some instances, so to get a, around, there's always a loophole, if you will. Mr. Campbell is very, very correct as far as that goes. However, in this case, um, I've said it also a couple times in our meetings, most of the time the people that get the license aren't the ones causing the problems. So the, the, both those factors, what Mr. Campbell said and that the people that are getting the license usually are the people going by the book. So with both of those being said, Mr. Rose. I'm open. We're yeah. open. Yeah. I was going to make a comment similar to um, Mr. Campbell's in that um, in the many meetings that uh, staff let me sit in on and, and put up with me on, um, we, we talked a lot about trying to come up with a simplified rule that everybody would know exactly what it was and when it was and easier to enforce. And we did talk about uh, previously the earlier possibility, um, but then went to the later date recognizing that in today's economy, many homes are empty until 5.30 or 6 in the evening when both working, however many working people there are in that home, uh, get back. And we didn't want to unduly penalize those folks who are trying to make a, a living by following the rules and, and canvassing or soliciting door to door. So that's partly how we ended up with these. but. You know, there's, there, there's, no, there's no real hard rule that says it's got to be this or it's got to be that. So uh, I, I feel fairly certain that the, the drafters of this proposed ordinance would uh, go along with whatever it is that council members decide they want to do. Mr. Morrow. Well, as I previously stated, I, at a previous meeting, offered uh, an amendment to, to adjust the the uh, duration of solicitation um, and so as it relates to your suggestions and comments I would be amenable to offering an amendment um, my the reason I hesitated in doing that was at the previous meeting there was uh, a consensus that that was not appropriate and that was not ideal so I'm happy to, to, to offer it but if there's not a consensus or people disagree with that that approach or that standard that you know sort of futile well, I guess I'd be curious to hear from the rest of the council if what the sense is because you know it's that's a personal I don't know Mr. Gearby you have any comments? I mean I understand the issue with the concern about being after dark um, and but we do allow solicitation on Saturday for a full eight hours so it's almost I'm not sure if they're going to be working a full six hours or six days a week but we at least have the full day of Saturday that they can try and offset that hour that they can't maybe not be able to reach individuals on the on the weekdays so it's a balance. If we're really looking at the concern of, pub, of safety and that type of issue, I'd rather go for the 6 o'clock. Well, I was I thinking instead of actually putting a time, we could, because I think that changes. I think we say with or by 7 or within half an hour sun, uh, after sunset. So that it's, and that it, I think people would understand when you did the licensing, it would just be a, that would be pretty self-explanatory, wouldn't it? I mean, Saying after sunset, so that means in the summer they can solicit until 10? No, you no. say to, to between 10 and 7 p.m. Oh, okay. Or, or within mm -hmm. half an hour after sunset. Okay. So, mm -hmm. well, okay, that's a good point. So then would they read that as? It yeah. could conflict. Uh -huh. yeah. It'd be out till 10.30. <laughs> well, you're, we're saying. Whichever is earlier. I guess you, you have to say whichever is earlier. I'm a little confused, Mr. Lupi or Detective Lupi, maybe you can elaborate. Why the half hour after sunset? It would seem to me that you would just say at well, sunset. When, when the sun sets, it's still light out. Right. So it takes a half hour for it to get dark, basically. Okay. So you're giving them that little extra yeah. window. And, and that was just a discussion I had because that's what the hunting rules okay. state in the hunting laws. So. Well, that's, it also gives room for some, if somebody doesn't really know exactly when sunset is. 
You know, I mean, it's this dark. isn't supposed <laughs> to be to totally you know, restrictive and sure. unreasonable. So, I, I, I mean, I, while, I mean, I just put it out there. Right? The rest of the council is fine with the way it's written. I could vote for this, but I just wanted to hear what, I know we talked about it before. <laughs> Mr. Hart. Thank you. Um, I, in general, I'm, I'm in favor of, of clear um, and simple rules that are easy to divine, define and easy to understand. So I, I guess I would prefer not to go with something that added ambiguity. Um, and I think I, I agree with Mr. Gerba that um, possibly the Saturday hours would offset the loss of six to seven. Um, so I, I would be inclined to go in that to to change to six o'clock as a cutoff time instead of seven. Okay. Any further discussion? Well, I'm going to offer the same amendment then that I did at the at our, our previous meeting. I'm going to offer that uh, we amend section 22-34 hours of operation to read that soliciting is only allowed within the city between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And also quote it. Okay, so that's an amendment to the Discussion on the amendment. Okay, all in favor of the amendment to change it to 10 to 6 p.m. 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the amendment carries. So the motion would be amended to include hours to 6 p.m. Got all screwed up in my stuff here. <laughs> many papers. So we have two changes then to this current. That we be to add the transient merchants on those five and then and then the hours of operation change to six PM. Is that correct? Does everybody have that? It's actually just four. Just four number five doesn't yeah. Oh right, sorry. Okay, so um, we have a revised um, ordinance number 735. Everybody understands what the revisions are. Is there further discussion on the motion? So the motion right now is to um, acknowledge receipt. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, so now we need a motion to approve and adopt or not adopt the revised ordinance number 735. Move to approve and adopt. Second. Actually, my. Uh, I, when I moved that motion, I included the words approve and adopt. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. I did. But I did not include the part, the last part about the uh, fees. Hmm. So. Because I just read the motion as a motion to just not receive. Right, that's why I just said what I did because I did something different than what you just said. Okay, well, I didn't catch that. So, um,. Okay, well, we had an amendment to um, the ordinance and the, the amendment was approved, so that means that we would need a motion. So we had, I'll reread, the motion would have been to acknowledge receipt of um, the text through the ordinance number 735, replace it with a revised article number two, which we have subsequently revised, and to approve and adopt the ordinance as submitted. So, as revised, as revised sorry. Is everybody following along so far? We still have one more piece of this motion. So, should I, do I need to recall that motion? Yes. I, miss, I didn't explain it properly. So, um, everybody understands the motion that I didn't call correctly the first time. So, this would be a motion to approve and adopt and, um, said revised ordinance number 735. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we need a motion to approve or not approve the fees for solicitors and transient merchants as recommended mm -hmm. by staff to become a part of the city's fee book. Move to approve 
fees. Second. Move roads, second to her. Discussion. Do you have a motion to approve the fees? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Everybody cleaning Mr. Rhodes. I don't know if you I know you spent a lot of time on it also. Um, our next item is item 11182. This is a motion um, to acknowledge receive the December 1st, 2011 memo from Finance Director for Goring regarding the hypothetical loss of Selene's fiscal year 12, which would be July 11th, uh, July 1, uh, 2011 through June 30th, 2012, personal property taxes. And I'm changing this to report back in our first meeting in January with follow up, um, which I would like to get into in the discussion. But basically, this is an issue that's outstanding and I think we need to stay on top of at our meeting. So, um, if someone would be willing to move that, that would be great. Move. Support. Moral, second roads. So basically, as was outlined in uh, Mr. Burgoyne's memo, what we thought was a 20% impact to our um, financial situation, our total revenues actually has been reevaluated to be a almost a 22% impact uh, to the negative. And also, he outlines in this memo that we would not be able to um, replace this. <laughs> so we would be able to replace portions of it. I don't know, Mr. Burgoyne, if you want to speak to this right now. The reason that I took it off consent and put it on our regular agenda, as we've talked about multiple times, we're trying to keep track of how this is going in Lansing, and I don't want this to get lost. And I mean, I know they've said they're not going to talk about it, and they're not going to do anything with it until January. Um, so while um, this, you know, we have reevaluated the situation, I don't want this to get lost in the future. So that's why I wanted to take it off consent and put it um, make sure that the first meeting in January and you know we will continue to try to have the town hall and do whatever else we can to raise awareness. So Mr. Burgoyne, do you want to speak to this at all? Yes. Um, well, originally um, we had looked in terms of the share of personal property tax in our overall uh, share of taxable value. But um, there's a second step which is that Celine's been fortunate to have strong industrial growth in the, in the city. There are four, in, four industrial parks. Over the years, the city has planned to um, help bring in industry. So the city's fortunate on one hand. On the other hand, uh, we have obligations, um, bonds that run through 2024 and therefore infrastructure and support of the main arteries in, in the city um, Maple Road, North Ann Arbor, Woodland Drive and so forth and in the industrial parks themselves and amenities like the city's own parks like Mill Pond and so forth. Um, the city has invested in that and the city has bonded some of the infrastructure. And now if you lose the source of revenue for the bonds, you're in real hurt. So it depends how much of it is replaced and in which way. I mean, it's, it's just a, uh, a political choice as to what types of revenues you have and how you deal with that. And um, there are different choices that this new administration wants to make in terms of, of showing uh, what Michigan is and how Michigan supports industry and, and jobs. But on the other hand, the city needs revenue. So if that change happens and the city doesn't lose a lot of revenue, we'll get through it. Um, that, that's the issue. Are we going? how much of that revenue will be lost. Right, I think it's a big question. The other issue, you know, is that's where our growth is. <laughs> it's not in land values. You know, we've had uh, valuations, you know, 30%, I mean, significant valuation decreases and to the point where 
and because of Proposal A, we can't get that increase back in a year or two. We can only get, you know, the COLA or 3%. So we're never going to be able to recover through land values. The only way we can get any kind of growth in our revenues is from personal property. So well, we're totally fried. Well, it's, it's, not, or the, if we sell it's the not the land. It's not the only way for future growth. I mean, in the future, we would want Class A buildings like medical centers or, you know, um, types of facilities that have a lot of real property facility to it and not much machinery. I mean, we and everybody else in this um, state would no longer be interested in industry with a whole bunch of machinery and equipment. Mm -hmm. So there would be a change in the, in the approach, I think. Well, okay. Is there any further discussion on this motion? So the plan would be to bring this back for um, further discussion the first meeting of January to keep on top of what's going on and maybe have, try to get that town hall, see where we stand after the holiday. Okay, so we have a motion and a support. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then our other item that came off consent is a motion to now receive the November 30th, 2011 memo for a finance director Burgoyne regarding first amended fiscal year 12 EDC budget to approve and adopt the first amended fiscal year 12 EDC budget as submitted. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'll move. Second. Will Gearbox second to Har? Um, Mr. Gearbox? Yeah, a couple questions on it. Lee, when we discussed this at the EDC meeting, um, I know we talked about moving the $9,000 out of the one ED snatch, but I didn't realize it was coming out of the donations community pavilion line. Don't we have to maintain that in there if that was originally in a donation or if that was, or that terminology isn't accurate? That, that's accurate. The, um, there were two things involved here. There was a potential donation, just potential. It was just a budgeted donation. And there was a challenge $9,000 for the $9,000 of potential donation. So, in other words, EDC was putting up $9,000 as a challenge to people against a ma that matching amount. Now, after the EDC meeting, or at the EDC meeting, rather, um, it was brought to, to my knowledge, where I didn't know that before that, that that's no longer a short-term goal this pavilion right. issue. So it, it should no longer be in a short-term budget. So that's the reason for backing that up. The, the other major change after the EDC meeting uh, was the, immediately after the EDC meeting, I received an invoice for downtown lighting. And that was not fully in the budget. And there was uh, a misunderstanding as to um, how much to spend on downtown lighting. Uh, the amount spent was in the order of $6,000. And in our um, contract with the Chamber of Commerce this year, we had $1,000 and we had $500 that came in as a donation. The, um, due to the misunderstanding, the schedule went forward on the lighting without this having been in the budget, in this year's budget. It was in a prior year budget, in the fiscal year 09 budget, there was $5,800 in there. And <clears throat> the Chamber's understanding was, once you put the money up there, the money's good in future budgets. And it's not, you do the budget each year, but it, it was a misunderstanding. Right. <clears throat> Those are city <coughs> rights, and we, we really should pay for some. Right. No, my question rights. was, though, we had allocated that <coughs> idea of moving that $9,000 to the um, support of the Selene Main Street program. Which it was. Which it was moved, but I'm thinking maybe we would have backed that off and not moved as much to them to cover that expense if we'd known it was going to be available. I really don't like the idea of removing the budget from the professional services line to pay for this now. I, I did check on professional services and it has run between $1,500 and $6,000. And it's not very much used there so far this year. 
So it doesn't look like it will reach 5,000 this so year. So, so that there's really not a negative issue to doing that. Okay. I just want to clarify because we were yeah. trying to decide that. I look back half a dozen years to make sure. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Further discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, under new business item 11185, request for waiver of penalty and interest on utility bill Allegra. This is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the November 30th, 2011 memo from C. Treasurer Bennett and the November 16th, 2011 letter from Allegra Print and Imaging to approve or deny the request of Allegra Print and Imaging for a waiver of the penalty and interest fees in the amount of $27.38 on their utility bill. I acknowledge the receipt. Motion to not receive. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion? Mr. Rowe. Um, well, I can empathize with these folks based on our several previous um, discussions and decisions on council about waiving penalties and interest. All of those were denied, and so I would expect that this one would also need to be denied. Is there further discussion? Mr. Peters? Yeah, I, I think we should approve it. Uh, these folks are our neighbors and part of the community. They're involved with the March of Dimes. They get involved with uh, volunteering for safe houses. They're involved with skull fundraisers. Uh, I'm sure they're a bunch of busy folks. They must feel strong about this. Well, they, they wouldn't have written a letter for, for $27. And I think it's, it's our job here in council to, be, to work with our, our neighbors and business people and, and uh, go ahead and approve the request. Um, I know our treasurer's here. Do you want to talk about how many requests we get for uh, what our policy has been in the past? We have had, in the past, we do not normally waive them because we do get a lot of requests for people that miss the 5 o'clock deadline by five minutes. Um, it can become quite a problem if we start opening the door for this. Ms. Bennett. What? Gretchen said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been doing this for 13 years. Jim has been doing it for four months. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, over the course of the 26 years that I've been here with the city in, in the capacity of the treasurer's office, we've had a number of people who, um, for whatever reason, some of them being extremely um, severe, you know, you, your heart goes out to these people, some of them just being, oops, I forgot and I was a little bit late. Um, there's a fine line in how much that we you know that we can waive and not waive unless there's a clerical error because I would be spending all my time and I'm not always such a good judgment on someone's story you know to um, be waiving them so the city code I believe does uh, say that the body who authorized the charges to be assessed are the body who waives those charges and they're the only the only makeup that can that can happen so which I kind of like because I don't have to make those decisions. <laughs> I can blame all of you. <laughs> but, um, but it would open up a floodgate in the future, and, you know, for everyone that comes in because, I mean, we've all paid it late. Everyone has that mistake, but we also have to own up and accept our responsibility and, and move ahead. And like I said, we've had some very um, heartbreaking stories come in as to how and why they're late, and there's nothing we can really do about it. It, and that's just been the stands that I have, that this body of people have provided me guidance for the past 26 years. I think that also the, the problem is there's no line then. If, right. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate that they didn't get the bill. I actually got a call from a friend his father's water bill, and her father had, was in the hospital and he ended up dying, and she called, and I mean, I mean there's tragedy stories right. too. Yep. So it's, I mean, so I um, appreciate, my perspective would be on this, that I appreciate um, this is a good business in our community and certainly anybody that, um, it's not a question of whether or not um, I would support this business and you know, we always wanna help our business out, but I think this is, again, you know, this happens on a regular basis that people miss the deadline for one reason or another. And um, so my personal feeling, I will not be voting to waive this. But right now, the motion is only to acknowledge receipt. Yes. And Allegra has paid it in full. 
Um, they have had a wonderful, you know, they are very good at paying their bills. There is no history of them paying them late. Um, you know, it's just, they, but they did pay it in full and then submitted the letter for the request. So right now we have a motion um, to not proceed. Is there any discussions or any questions for our Fair. treasurer? I just have a question kind of con related to this. How do we handle penalties when people don't pay the full bill and when they're doing late penalties? I understand we've had some that don't pay the full bill or carry a balance for a while. This the penalty is, is a percentage of the unpaid balance so of the actual the bill. So it be the water charges or the um, tax charges. Okay, so it's a percentage of what's until, unpaid. Okay, it accrues until when we write them off in the next year? If they don't pay it or do we continue to carry the balance as long as they're paying towards it? We don't write off. We will submit them to Washtenaw County for that's payment on I, their taxes, but they I'm don't saying. really get wrote, written off. It will continue to accrue. Okay. And then when it goes to the county, once a water bill goes past the um, June 1st and we start submitting them to Washtenaw County, there's an additional $75 transfer fee that is added as an administrative fee to put that over to the county. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any question, more questions for our treasurer? Thank you. Um, so right now we have a motion to nod receipt. Any further discussion on the motion to acknowledge receipt? Um, all in favor to acknowledge receipt say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Do we have a motion to approve or deny the request of Allegra Print and Imaging for waiver of the penalty and interest fees in the amount of $27.38 on their utility bill? I'll move to deny. Second. Discussion? I already said I will be voting to deny for the reasons that I outlined when we were talking about acknowledging receipt. And that it does not, I don't think anybody here on council wants our business on Allegra Print to think that we don't support the business. So please don't misconstrue that, this denial. <clears throat> um, a further discussion on the motion? All in favor say, this is a motion to deny. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. Item 11186, Saline Recreation Center Vending Services. The motion to acknowledge receipt of the November 16, 2011 memo from Parks and Recreation Director Scruggs regarding vending machine partnership with Saline Young Adult Program. To approve or not approve an agreement with Saline, between Saline Area Schools and the City of Saline for vending services at the Saline Recreation Center by the Saline Young Adult Program with 25% commission to be paid to the Saline Recreation Center and to authorize or not authorize the mayor and clerk to execute said agreement. Move to approve and authorize. Second. Move road, second to Har. Discussion? No discussion. Madam Mayor. Mr. Roth. I, in reviewing the materials, I need some clarification. It says one place 33% of their profits, and then he's saying that he can it, they barely break even, so I'm wondering if it's 33% of the sales rather than profits, kind of if it's 33% of the profits, that means that he had twice as much as we've earned and we, we made some money on it. So I think that's some miswording there, should be probably of sales, it's not making itself clear. And also on the contract that you have, I th would like to see that it would be changed, updated, to where it says beginning on September 17, 2010. Let's make it to the current date or whatever date you wish to have it. And then change, change, change it, the wording, and also have the, the signature that you have on behind your far as administrative services signed and dated to the current date that this contract shall be in agreement. I want to say that I thoroughly think it's a great activity. I'm glad it worked out. and. In support of it, I just like to have these things clarified, whether it's sales or profits. And I also like to make sure that we have a proper contract with the right dates and signatures. Correct. Um, after this evening, whether if, if City Council approves this, um, an updated contract with the current dates would, would be um, sent over to the schools for their signature as well as the mayor and it is reviewed by um, 
Our city attorney, Alan Grossman. Now, can you clarify, is it profits or is it sales? Uh, the contract read, it is the 33% um, of the, it's, it's our commission of the profits, yes. It's 25%. I'm sorry? You're changing it from 33 last year to 25 Correct, to 25%. That's of the profits. Yes, there's there's sales profits, correct. So whatever, for example, <laughs> and this is, I'll invite, um, this is Kevin Muss, and he's the director of special education. Um, we uh, we formulated this uh, partnership last year, and and we've been successfully working together for the past year. Um, and when we sat down to review the contract to determine whether we wanted to progress with this for another year, um, uh, Mr. Musson uh, sat down with us and, and expressed a few concerns. And first, let me say that we're very pleased with the um, their service and and with the program, and I believe they're they're very um, happy as well. Except for there's a lot there was a lot of startup cost, and they're they're seeing a little bit more expense on their side um, for maintaining the the machines and servicing them. Uh, than what they anticipated getting into this into this um, partnership, so that's why we sat down to figure out what would make sense for them and what would make sense for us um, to continue on, um, and that's how we came up with the uh, the 25 percent. And I don't know if maybe you want to um, talk about the you know how how we get paid out of the sales. Yeah, we correct? usually do quarterly checks to uh, Carla. She submits a bill to us, and then we go over the money. It's not something that we actually had touched for one year. We let the money sit in an account just to make sure that we were covering ourselves appropriately at the schools. So, um, and then from there we sat down and done quarterly checks to Carla to, to pay her then the commission for letting us keep the machines there. And we are very thankful for this opportunity and we do want to definitely continue it. It's just with the cost of fuel and driving back and forth to Sam's Club and not quite knowing what we were getting ourselves into at first, we're still excited about the opportunity and definitely want to continue it. Does that answer your question? Yes, I just want to be sure that everything was, whether it's definition of sales or profits, okay. I and mean, there's a big difference. There is. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on this motion? All in favor to approve and authorize, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Item 11187, Amendment to Rules and Regulations for Oakwood Cemetery and Fees. This is a motion to acknowledge receive the November 30th, 2011 memo from City Clerk Hill to approve and adopt or not adopt the proposed amended rules and regulations for Oakwood Cemetery as submitted or amended to approve or not approve the fee schedule dated September 28, 2011, reflecting prices for the sale of crypts and niches and for the internment fees for crypts and niches effective December 15, 2011, with said fees to become a part of the city's fee book. Move to approve and adopt uh, as submitted and to approve. Move moral. Do you have a second? I second. Second Roth. My memo was actually December 1st. Oh, okay. Sure. Sorry. Ch change the receipt of the December 1st <coughs> from November 30th to December 1st. Okay. And from Clerk Hill and, and Engineer Rubel. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor with those changes. Is that correct, gentlemen? Um, discussion. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, to all my colleagues, I believe that I uh, announced at our last council meeting that this document would be. Um, coming before us sometime during the month of December, and I'm, I'm very pleased that Clerk Hill was able to get it to us at our first meeting in December. Um, I also mentioned that the Cemetery Board of Appeals had a rather long and lengthy meeting in which we thoroughly discussed the proposed changes um, to ordinance number 735, um, as well as to the fee book. Um, I do want to state um, in regards to comments that were made during the public comment period that we did discuss um, the allocation of funds from the Perpetual Cares Fund to refurbish and restore um, existing headstones in Oakwood Cemetery. Um, the motion to proceed with that concept um, failed to yield a second. 
Um, but there was a consensus that the um, Cemetery Board of Appeals would empower the clerk to research that issue further and then come back with a recommendation at a subsequent Cemetery, of a Bo Cemetery Board of Appeals meeting. And Clerk Hill, you can correct me if I'm wrong in that, that assumption. Um, but we didn't discount that idea. We simply, I, I, well, I can only speak for myself, but I can say that I, I didn't have enough uh, information and data um, to, to move forward. Um, so again, as, as the um, council representative on the Cemetery Board of Appeals, I, I endorse, enthusiastically endorse this document um, and hope that it will be approved and uh, adopted this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes. A um, couple, three comments. One is um, there appears to be something missing on the bottom of page 14. There's a, there's a sentence that just sort of ends and doesn't get picked up on page 15. I'm not sure what was intended to be there. And uh, another comment is that I would, I would like to see items like this, policy items and ordinances come to us for a, in effect, a first reading or just acknowledge receipt and discussion and then come back at a subsequent meeting for approval. I, I think it's really too much information in here for us to act on with only a weekend to uh, review those of us that didn't have the benefit of having been part of the group that put it together. And then my third and final comment is that with respect to uh, preservation of headstones in cemeteries, there are two, two approaches to that by uh, strike preservationists, cemetery preservationists. One is to leave things as they are because that is in fact what they are. The second is to do some preservation work on the headstones to clean them up, remove some of the algae growth, and to reset them. And there's no clear-cut answer to that. Depends uh, much on the feelings of the, of the local governing body and the, and the citizenry as to which approach is taken. And I know that in, for Oakwood Cemetery, we, we've decided a number of years ago not to do that. Um, we did have a meeting in the year now with a gentleman who does cemetery preservation work uh, down at, at the cemetery and there, were, there was a group of us, probably a dozen or so folks who walked around and looked at things and talked to him and he, he explained about the different processes that could be used. And there was some thought at that point in time about trying to put together, in effect, a Friends of Oakwood Cemetery group that would private money donations and grants to uh, to do any restoration work that uh, was deemed necessary on the headstones. That, that group never really got off the ground. Um, there were some concerns about whether or not it was the right thing to do. There were some concerns about should we be messing with somebody's grandmother's or great grandfather's headstone. You know, do we have the right to do that? So. Um, and I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the answer is to that question, but um, I don't think that we have a clear-cut obligation to do headstone preservation. That's my comments. Thank you. Is there other discussion, Mr. Gearbox? Uh, just a clarification for me. Um, how do we handle organizations that are that come into the cemetery and place items on the grave sites? Do we expect them to come back and remove those items, or? Is it part of our cleanup where we take it off? From my perspective, when I've heard comments, I believe if you're putting it in there, you should be the one that takes it off. But I didn't know if we had anything that strictly addresses that issue about organizations that come forth and put, place things on graves. We don't have anything in there specifically about organizations. We do about um, family members or whatever putting things out. Um, and we remove them if they become unsightly. And we have two cleanups per year, but nothing specifically on organizations. Well, I mean, that's a concern that if we're having American flags placed on the graves and they're becoming, you know, um, don't look well after a few mm -hmm. months, I would basically expect whoever placed them on there would be the ones that would clean them up. But if that's going to be our role to do that, then I would not want to have any kind of individuals be upset from the perspective of us removing a flag from their cemetery grave. So I would think that we would adopt the, and how we have it in here is appropriate, that we clean it up twice a year and mm -hmm. whatever it is, it comes off the grave and it goes where it goes. 
because I've seen some stuff where I think judgment has been thought that some things should stay on, some shouldn't, but if the city is going to clean it up, we're cleaning it up and we'll take the heat for it, no differently than what we take the heat for the uh, issue of not waiving a um, penalty. We, gotta, we have the rules put in place, we should follow them. Thank you for um, clarifying that on this too. The other thing too, um, there's a comment about flowering bushes and vines and such. Does that include rose bushes? We would yes. consider that a flowering, okay. Because I do know there are some of those recently placed down on the graves down there. So, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, Council Member Roth came to me today um, with some suggested housekeeping. Um, he noted that there's several areas in there where we talk about lot. In some places, we changed it to grave space, and it isn't consistent throughout, which I have no problem of going back through and doing that housekeeping if council doesn't have a problem with that, as well as um, certificate of right of burial and what we call that, just to make it consistent throughout. Wouldn't change the meaning or, or anything. It would just, you know, clean up the wording. Mr. Morrow. Um, if, uh, to uh, Clerk Hill's point, if it's not an issue of substance, but rather a, a housekeeping item or a grammatical change, I would be more than happy to empower her um, to make those changes and not have to constantly come back to council um, for review and for consideration. Uh, additionally, I'll a I should add that I should apologize. Um, during my comments, I think I cited some ordinance number and I was <laughs> reviewing the wrong document. I understand that this is not an ordinance change, but just an amendment um, in, in addition to our, our, our rules, policies, and uh, our fee book. So I just wanted to clarify. One other comment. Um, Mr. Rhodes commented that um, the bottom of page 14, um, that should continue to read at last sentence, it should be, the city may remove and dispose without notice trees or shrubs planted in violation of this rule. <coughs> My other copy I have has it on, and for some reason, this one has it cut off. So just how it printed out, I guess. This rule. Mr. Rubel has worked on this project since December of last year. He started um, making changes and updates in relationship to the proposed new projects. Um, he's worked extensively on this, and all of the new ones in red that you see, um, he's pretty much come up with that wording, and I fine tuned it a little bit. But I think it's a good start for those sections, and it's a working document that we may have to come back and um, request some other changes. But for the most part, most of these rules have been in existence for a long time, and they've worked well. Always needs fine tuning. Things always crop up. Discuss further discussion. I'll just make a couple comments. I know I missed the last meeting and um, there was some uh, discussion. First of all, I um, understand, Mr. Rhodes, your concern about this is a pretty lengthy document, but um, not a lot of change um, in substance to it, and except for, you know, we have changed the nature of the cemetery a bit and to accommodate that, but I think the intention as stated at the beginning in the dedication section that um, the purpose of these rules and regulations are to provide the public with a modern cemetery, burial space at a reasonable cost, and perpetual care and maintenance of the entire property um, was taken into account with the update and also Mr. Rubel's um, analysis and rate analysis to continue to ensure that the perpetual care fund is and actually continue to grow. And um, it seems to me, based on the financials and the rules and regulations, that um, looks really good considering a few years ago we were talking about running out of space and what were we going to do. And so for the short term, you know, for the next few years, um, I think we're in good shape and I'd like to uh, thank staff for the hard work and I know the committee also worked really hard on this too. Um, I have walked the cemetery, I do actually, maybe I'm sort of weird that way, but I'm a walker and I like history and um, my dad actually lives really near a cemetery that has lots from 1700s. A very old cemetery and um, it's pretty well maintained but it's maintained by volunteers and um, in the past I've actually suggested that um, uh, when Rick Coos was involved with the EMU the historic preservation program there that this could be an interesting project for some of the students as a intern um, 
I think it could be a really good program and there'd be a lot of learning. So, because I believe that the cemetery is on the National Register and it does have historical significance to our region. Um, however, I would agree with you that it's not our responsibility as a city to maintain the headstone. So that would be something that would be something the community would need to take on. Um, I know there was some s concern about, you know, the viability of the perpetual care fund and I think that is well documented in the um, paperwork we have tonight. So um, I guess that's all I would have to say is thank you all for your hard work and um, appreciate um, the ongoing productivity of our cemetery. Just sort of a unique thing to say. <laughs> But, um, okay, so is there any other discussion on this um, motion? If not, we have a motion to uh, approve and adopt uh, um, as submitted and approve. So if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under 11188, the biosolids <coughs> falling contract, this is a motion to acknowledge receive the November 22nd, 2011 memo from Superintendent Board of Production and Pollution Control Skull to award a five-year contract to Sinegro Midwest in the amount of $0.0317 per gallon with an annual increase of 2% plus fuel charge and a CPI annual increase to provide the city of Selene with its biosolids or sludge hauling and land application beginning January 1, 2012 to authorize or not authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the materials management agreement with Sinegro Midwest after a review and approval by the city attorney. Do we have a motion? So move. Authorize. Move Rhodes. We have a second? Second. Second Peters to authorize. Discussion. Um, yeah, I just had a question about um, the relation. You know, have we had a partnership with Sinegro in the past? We did. Uh, actually, we had them for about 10 years. With the last contract, they came in a little high, so we went with uh, Biotech. Okay, that was my only question. Because I, I saw that you said that, and I know you had checked references and other, but okay. I like the numbers. <laughs> just wanted to verify It's that. actually both, uh, both bids came in considerably lower than we're paying now. It's very good. Great. Yeah. I'd like to hear that. Save some money. Any questions for Mr. Skull? Thanks a lot for staying. <laughs> okay, uh, so n there's no further discussion on this motion. All in favor to authorize say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 11189, council calendar for 2012. So motion to acknowledge receive the November 30th, 2011 memo from City Clerk Hill to approve the council calendar on our meeting dates for 2012 as submitted or as amended. Moved. Moved. Go ahead, Mr. Yerba. Thank you. I'll second it. Move gear by second, Marl. To do what? I'm assuming oh, he, you said approve and submitted. As Sorry. submitted. Okay. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Yep. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, commission and committee reports from council members? Anybody? Nope. Not uh, reports and other announcements. Great parade chambers here somewhere. I thought yep. I saw them come in. Thank you very much. Mr. Rhodes. I'd like to make a, uh, a comment about a film that I saw the other night that the school showed. It's called Race to Nowhere. And it's a, it's a very moving film. And it talked about the pressures that are applied um, unwittingly sometimes to our students to participate in anything and everything that they can and to take as many advanced placement courses as they can because they need to have that to get into the uh, universities and colleges that they want to apply to and um, the things that it does to the kids, to the students. It's, it was very moving. Um, the schools have it under a limited license at the moment because it has not yet been released to the public. And so they can only show it uh, under very controlled circumstances. But I, I think at some point in time, it will be available for more general showing. And um, if, if we are able to determine the next time that the schools show that and invite ourselves in to sit in on that, I, that would be really, really great. It's, it's a tremendous film. Are there any other reports or announcements? Okay, Mr. Campbell, would you like to talk about the process for the chief replacement? 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as you all have my uh, memo, um, I see we have two. We have a short term and a long term um, that we need to resolve. One is uh, uh, interim appointment as Chief Bunton's uh, retirement will be mid-January. Um, so we need, we need to have someone to be able to um, keep their hand on the rudder, if you will, um, while we're going through the official process for the permanent position. So as you see in my memo, um, what I'm proposing, I, I've made several phone calls to law enforcement officials, uh, professionals, um, to get some ideas or some suggestions for possible interim folks. And uh, I have uh, three, um, I believe, uh, very good candidates. Uh, I have spoken with all three of them uh, via phone with a fairly detailed um, uh, interview process or interview questions. Um, as you see in my uh, memo, I propose that the uh, mayor and I, the mayor Driscoll and I, would meet with these folks uh, face to face uh, for a second interview, and then make a recommendation at the next meeting, the next regular meeting on December 19th, to the city council for approval of appointment of an interim uh, police chief. Um, also involved in that would be um, a uh, a background check as well. Certainly, uh, the, the interim position is uh, is very important as well. And I, I guess I want to back up that um, I believe that the my position anyway is that the police chief um, is just as important as a city manager position. Not to say that all I mean all city positions are important, but certainly a very very important um, to do our best do our due diligence to, to find that right person, uh, that right fit um, to lead uh, the department, which is a very, very well thought of, a very professional department. Um, so I know I'm not telling you all anything you already don't know, but um, so um, then also, so that's the, the short term. The long term uh, suggestion or strategy it would be to um, the outside uh, search firm, which I do have a couple proposals already, um, use that outside search firm to help us um, determine the profile or develop a profile for the, for the for the new chief, and a couple ideas uh, that uh, uh, that I've put in there is one is having uh, like a town hall type meeting to ask our residents uh, what they would like to see, characteristics that they'd like to see in the in the in their police chief. Um, as well as uh, have a discussion with our uh, department heads because obviously the, the police chief is a very important part of the executive team. And then also uh, sit down with the police department personnel um, and help them, uh, ask them what they uh, want to see, what they believe are the, the qualities, characteristics uh, of, a, uh, of a chief the, that they believe needs to, to be incorporated into the, the profile. Once that profile is completed, uh, propose that um, because this is a this is an appointment by the city council, um, answers to the city manager day to day, but is appointed by the, the city council. So I pr propose a um, a committee or you know hiring committee, um, hiring task force. You choose the terminology, uh, which the membership would consist of one to three members of the council. Um, so we're not violating any. Um, quorum, any uh, open meetings uh, laws, um, the city manager, and then two law enforcement professionals, um, whether that be a local chief, um, uh, someone from, from MCOLS, from the state, for instance, um, that would help uh, vet through those. Um, because I, I will say, I believe, whether it's a national search, whether it's a statewide search, um, I believe we will get a lot of qualified applicants. Um, Selena is a very desirable place to be. Um, so, um, but it's again, it's it's uh, it's also a specialized position too. And so, I think it's highly important that we have some law enforcement pro professionals that, that have the experience, know know the uh, the questions, and to be able to determine 
what's a good answer or what's an average answer, what's a bad answer, whatever. Um, so then at that point, you know, my thought is probably to, to vet them down to probably, you know, eight or 12 and then have that, that um, committee, that hiring committee uh, perform um, oral boards. And then at that point, narrow it down to say the top two or three, present those top two or three to the overall council for the overall council to interview. Um, and then make that appointment um, again uh, even a more thorough background investigation uh, for that particular position. Um, I think probably uh, a good average, probably about, probably take about five or six months to go through this process. Um, I mean, in my perfect world, it'd be three or four, but I think we want to do it the right way. We want to give ourselves time um, to do it right. Um, so that is, um, well, let me back up. So once we, um, if, if city council agrees uh, with my, pro my proposed strategy, um, once, we get, um, once we get the uh, interim in position, then we could evaluate the proposals of the search firms, possibly have a work session, that type of thing, um, whether it be all the, the candidate uh, firms or just one or whatever, um, to, you know, to s talk with them, see, and, and make sure that um, you like what they're proposing, and then um, then move forward. So that's that's my strategy uh, being proposed to see if, if that's the direction that uh, uh, city council would like to, to see. The, my understanding was the interim would not be a uh, candidate for the permanent position. That thank you. Uh, that that is my hope. Uh, that that would be. Um, Again, I don't know. In my perfect world, yes, it would, the person that is the interim would not be interested, would not be considered for the, the permanent position. Um, I would say I, I be cautious to, to, to tie our hands, but I would say that is certainly my, uh, I would prefer that. That's my preference that um, just because that way that there's, if we can find a, a person like that um, that's going to do a good job. Uh, leading the department, and they would be the leader of the department for that ex that particular finite amount of time, um, that, uh, that um, sorry, I'm, my head's going, you can imagine, as, as you all know, I've been, we've been working quite a lot on this, and, and so my head's about four steps ahead. Um, so, um, we could present, um, hopefully, the, out of those people that you've been talking to, have you been yes, uh, saying that that would be not a... Correct. That's been a question a to say. Right. That, thank you. That, that's been a question to say. I asked them, are you interested? And uh, I also let them know um, that's my preference is that the interim will not be considered. Um, I, mean, they, I mean, they could say, well, I, I changed my mind. And then, uh, but I want to I really... If at all possible, when somebody, I don't want somebody to point the finger and say, well, you knew who you wanted to hire and you just brought them in early. And I, that's, I mean, I want to do our utmost to be as transparent as possible that uh, um, if somebody does make an allegation, you can say, well, here's the proof. This is how it all went down. I mean, I, I can tell you, uh, I've already received interest from folks. And I've said, thank you very much. The process is not open yet. Um, when it is, you're welcome to submit, and we'll follow the process. But until then, you know, please hold on to your resumes because the, you know, again, I don't want any thoughts or any allegations in propriety. Um, so we want to we want to do this right. Any questions for Mr. Campbell, Mr. Gearbox? Just a qu question. You said that you had proposals from, or looking at proposals from executive search consultants. Will we be involving MML MML at all or uh, recommendation? That's one of the proposals I have. Thanks. I just wanted because they did work well with us before. Any questions for Mr. Campbell? Comments? Feedback? Is he on the are right track? Yeah, are you looking for consensus from us regarding whether your approach is the, the one that we would endorse? Yeah, that or a vehement don't do that. <laughs> so, no, yes, right. yeah. So if, if you're in agreement with it, consensus would be great. Uh, I'm, I I'm can fine. speak for myself personally. Yeah. I'm very much in, in favor of what you recommended. I think you've put a lot of thought and time into it, and I applaud you for that. 
think it's the approach that, that we should take. I also support that process. Mr. Roth. I likewise. Yes, also. Mary. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks for your work on this. Okay, payment of property taxes. Is that, Mr. Gearby, you had I just want a clarification because um, I always thought that as we looked at proposals that came in from property developers or owners or such, when they start looking at items that we always made sure and checked first that their property taxes were paid before we would proceed on any reviews or such. Um, I'm kind of wondering, clarifying on that, how a process of, well, actually one that was on our agenda tonight, but isn't there, managed to proceed so far without being stopped. And I guess I need to have a clarification of that being reviewed again and how we handle that, or was this something that happened in the middle of the transaction. If I could have a clarification on that. Because that was always one of the first steps I thought was supposed to happen when we get a permit or a request or whatever to look at something that they do not have outstanding property taxes. So I'm looking at policy for the city. Right. I would, I guess I would defer to, to Gary. Um, I know we did send that out. Um, uh, but I, I'm not positive the exact timing that we sent that out to the different departments to review. Um, but um, because I know during the middle of the process, Gary, if you could, for this particular instance, um, I remember, I'm trying to remember, it came out towards the end of, um, it was part of the discussion at the preliminary site plan and the grading made, I believe it was made a condition of the grading permit. Well, I'd have it, uh, the paperwork is not generated in the engineering department. I, I understand. It's that. at the application stage, so I, I can't answer to the process. Um, although um, I received a copy just before the preliminary site plan was submitted to the uh, planning commission. So I mean, it'd been in the process, but this uh, there were a number of uh, quandaries with this project. If you if you were on the planning commission, you would. No, I've been understand the, the well. quandaries my they concern, had with Actually, my concern was more of just the process of whether or not the property right. taxes were checked to make sure they were paid before right. this right. proceeded. Right. We shouldn't I, have put a lot of effort towards it had they not been done. Right. I guess I, I can't answer your question because I don't generate the, okay. I just want to the make relevance sure for that. In the future, that policy occurs. Thank you. Mr. Gearba, if I may, as the uh, one of the two council representatives to the Planning Commission, as it relates to the, the, the project that you specifically reference, I do know that when um, the applicant received initial site plan approval, one of the conditions which was offered as an amendment, I believe by Planning Commissioner Beardsley, was that um, the individual may proceed only after all back taxes and payments were made to the city. So that was added, that was inserted as a motion in this particular case. However, I don't, I certainly agree with you that that is something that we need to, to monitor and we need to be um, ag aggressive about because it probably shouldn't have gotten to that point. However, you know, we did throw that caveat out, I guess. Because it's happened multiple times and that's why I'm thinking we had a process put in place. that. I, I don't know if we have a formal policy. I, part, part of the pro, I mean, obviously we, an approval is subject to, it's in our ordinances? It's in our ordinances. I don't. I I'd like to have that checked in. We can look into it. Thank you. Um, that was part of the, you know, obviously a con uh, contingency on approval, and it was a contingency on the planning commission approval. It's sort of a way to tie, um, you know, development. But I think it's pretty clear there's a financial situation there, and the way to, to resolve that is for them to improve their site. So, you know, you have there's a process to get that to moving. Right. Be moving but there forward. is an expectation that most individuals will pay their taxes and not be in. Right. It was, like I said, it was tied to, to the approval, and that is not why it was pulled off um, the oh, agenda tonight. The franchise for the Burger King is, doesn't seem to be of interest to the corporate office, so they're reevaluating that part, portion of the project. Mr. Rhodes. I, I was going to bring up a similar comment um, before that item was pulled off the agenda, but it, it seems to me that we ought to have a policy that before anyone Whenever anybody submits a request to the city that involves staff time, that the very first thing that ought to be checked is that all city obligations are current 
whether it's property taxes or personal property taxes or utility bills or anything else, I don't think we should provide services to someone who is not living up to their obligation to the city. I'm, you know, I'm in favor of business, but I'm in favor of responsible business people. We'll have staff look into that and get back. Okay, Mr. Kama. Mr. Burgoyne? Um, I, I think there's also a distinction between discretionary things that the city does, such as um, waivers or tax abatements or things of that nature, and some governmental services that you may not be able to waive that as a government you have to carry out. Now, I'm not sure legally on, on the basic government services how you can withhold that. We'll have to look into that. It's a good question. Okay, is there any other discussion items? Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. I just wanted to give you an update on the, the speed limit. Oh, great. Um, Thank you. Lieutenant uh, Maggie, um, whom came to the last meeting um, and gave the report. Um, he called me today as he said he would report back in two weeks, which he did. Um, and some of the comments, um, of course, again, he appreciated the opportunity to come and speak at the last meeting and appreciated the comments from, from residents and, and the council. And so the two, two areas of concern um, that, that he heard, um, one, of course, near Curtis Park where the lane drops um, merge, um, and then also uh, from uh, Maple to Hopper, um, what they've said is that, that, that they agree with that not uh, changing those to the, uh, as far as the, um, all the way to 45. So what they've, I'm going to kind of run through from east to west, uh, what they're proposed, what, well, what they're, I mean, this is law, right? This is, this is how it's going to be done. Um, but at the same time, having said that, as he said, he says, hey, we, we want to be flexible, but the law is the law. Um, so industrial to Hopper, uh, 50 miles per hour. Hopper to Kevling, 45 miles an hour. Kevling to Harris, 40 miles per hour. Harris to Lewis, maintain the 30 miles per hour. Lewis to River Oaks. 40 miles per hour, River Oaks to Austin, 45 miles per hour. As far as time frame, they liked, uh, they, they're pushing to have this uh, closed out by December or prior to December 31st of 2011. And as far as when will signs go up, um, his response was it could be two days or two months. Just depends on, on uh, because MDOT has to issue the order and that type of thing. So. Um, so that is, that is what information he's given me. And I told him that I would report back um, any comments uh, um, that the city council may have. Okay. Um, Mr. Rhodes? Um, that's, that's some good news. I, I appreciate their, their working with us. The, uh, the last two segments, I was kind of running behind here, but did you say Lewis to River Oaks was yes, sir. 40? Yes, sir. And then River Oaks to Austin is 45? Yep, right. Where is River Oaks? By Baker's Nook. That's what I thought, so it's short. <laughs> Step it's like 100 on. feet or something Watch like that. River Oaks to Austin <laughs> seems foolish to me. To oh, well, okay. Any further discussion items? We have public comment under the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come forward at this time and comment or question to the City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested by not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Mary Hess. As for a record, yes, uh, when someone would make an application, part of the checklist would be the status of their payment of taxes. That goes back a ways, but it was for a lot of years. Uh, on the cemetery, I appreciate Mr. Gearbaugh as far as if you put them there, you should take them out. But it is our cemetery. And I think there should be an agreement and a please and thank you because the Boy Scouts do help put them out. And I'm sure if there was a, a request with the city and the American Legion, I'm sure it could be handled. Many people have passed away 
and they assume this has been handled. Uh, and I, I definitely agree that uh, there's a plan that can work. And uh, uh, Mayor, as far as you're walking through the cemetery, I would be glad to take you into the mausoleum because it's leaking like a sieve, especially in the dungeon room. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe we could have a citizens committee because there's other things that uh, the shrubs, you know, that are about five feet tall to where you can't even see the speaker on Memorial Day. There's small things, but uh, they definitely need to have someone or something bring it to the attention. And it would be nice if there would be some type of citizens committee to kind of bring it to council's agent, uh, attention. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Okay, um, do we have any other business to come before the Saline City Council? If not, um, we're going to be convening into closed session to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute, in particular to discuss a confidential written legal opinion subject to attorney client privilege. We need a motion for that. Move to convene into closed session. Second. Move tomorrow, second Gearbaugh. Roll call. Councilmember Gearbach? Yes. Councilmember Rhodes? Yes. Councilmember Morrow? Yes. Councilmember Roth? Yes. Councilmember Peters? Yes. Councilmember Chahar? Yes. Mayor Driscoll? Yes. We convened to closed session at 9.15. Are we reconvening? We will be reconvening. Okay. Okay, we need a mo uh, motion to end the closed session and to reconvene the regular session at 10.15. So moved. Second. Second. Move more, I'll second to her. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we have a motion to authorize the city attorney to proceed in accordance with the city attorney's confidential written legal opinion subject to attorney client privilege as given during the closed session earlier this evening. So moved. Move Rhodes. We have a second. Second. Second Gearbaugh. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And we need a motion to adjourn at 10 16. So, so moved. moved. Second. Moved. Tomorrow, second Gearbaugh. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.